Hi everyone, I'm Jason Key at SB Grid, Harvard Medical School in Boston. Thanks for joining me today. We'll get started. So for today, uh, I'd like to thank Tristan Kroll for joining us from Cambridge, UK. Um, Tristan's going to be telling us about iSoldi, which is a plugin for Chimera X, which is a pretty awesome tool, I have to say. I've really enjoyed playing with it. Um, uh, Tristan, are you there? Yes. Yeah, go right yes. ahead. Oh, before you start, let me just really quick say questions. You can send to me by chat. Um, keep your microphone muted if you can, and we can save the questions to the end. And uh, great, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you very much to the SB Grid team for the invitation to talk about Isolde. Uh, so I'm going to start with just a brief introduction about why uh, Isolde and talk about low resolution model building, which for people that haven't done it before, it is a hard job and historically has been a, a very hard job. But to put some numbers to that, if we look at the WWPDB as it stands right now, around 100, just over 150,000 structures that have experimental data, uh, 30, 36,000 of those with resolutions lower than two and a half angstroms and about 5,500 of those with, uh, with resolutions lower than three and a half angstroms. And about half of those last set, a little more than half of those last set, are the newer cryo-EM maps that are coming out. Now, if we look at those and look at their, valid their geometric validation statistics in terms of the mole probity score, and we see that there is essentially no correlation whatsoever between the quality of the model and its fit to data at these resolutions. So on the top, in the top plot here, we have the, the R3 score for X-ray models. So of course, lower is better. And the mole probity score, again, lower is better. Now the mole probity score for people that aren't familiar is effectively a log scale combination of atomic clashes. So atoms that are overlapping by less than their van der Waals radii, uh, poor backbone conformations and poor side chain conformations. And for, to give you a point of reference, the maximum possible mole probity score that you can get from a model that has every atom clashing and every, every residue, both the backbone and side chain outlier, is just over six. Uh, so some of these, the models up at the top here, are, are really in that ballpark. But the take home message here for X ray and for cryo EM data is that once you get out to these low resolutions, fit to data simply isn't enough of a measure of how good your model is. And the, the fact that there is such a big scatter here shows the, the scale of the problem, the, the task that people have had to deal with. So, why have I taken the approach I have with Isolde using interactive molecular dynamics? So let's go back and look at how models have traditionally been built using the traditional Engen-Huber uh, Engen uh, crystallographic restraints. For the purposes of the actual model building task at least, these have the, the, the only interactions that have been considered are your directly bonded ones. So your so the, the atom in purple here, for example, you have three bonds to deal with, four torsions, um, and three angles. So a 10, well, I call them force calculations here, but restraint calculations in, in whichever form you like to deal with. Now, the advantage of that is that it's computationally tractable, uh, especially when you're talking about mid-1990s, early 2000s computational hardware, which means that it was fast enough to actually work with, work with on a Desktop, desktop computer of that era, and works just fine when you have atomic resolution data, which tells you where most of your atoms are with, with some fairly high precision. But once you get to your lower resolutions where even um, identifying a side chain becomes a problem, this all becomes really frustrating and more and more intractable as, as atoms start to just slide through each other and, and fall into tangled messes. If we look at molecular dynamics, on the other hand, now the atoms are try, uh, treated as explicitly physical objects. So you're not only considering those uh, bonded interaction calculations, you're considering all the non-bonded interactions with the shell of atoms around, uh, uh, the, with the surrounding shell of atoms. So for that same purple atom now, if we use a 10 angstrom shell, 
you're talking about 790 non-bonded interactions now that you have to deal with. So you've gone from 10 to 800 or so interactions. Um, the advantage of that is that it keeps everything under control. Of course, the challenge is that it is much higher computational load. Um, now, up until five to ten years ago, the idea of actually doing molecular dynamics on any real system interactively was more or less a pipe dream unless you had an entire cluster sitting behind you. But with the advent of uh, GPU computing, that's becoming more and more tractable. So the, and Isolde is, is built upon this platform using interactive molecular dynamics as an environment to make that task of interactive model building much, much easier. And so I'll take you through some examples of that in a bit. So just a little bit about my goals in designing Isolde. Some of these, I will admit, are still goals rather than actualities, but hopefully I'm heading in the right direction. Now the first one, I, I do aim to make it as easy to use as possible, in particular simple to install. Uh, on, for Windows, Mac and Linux, it is, it, it is a very straightforward um, single click, in, well not single click, a few clicks to install it through the Chimerix toolshed. It should have a gentle learning curve and with not too much assumed knowledge and visually clear. Um, and I'll show you some examples as we get through it. Um, it needs to be flexible, so Isolde is designed to be quite agnostic to the data source. You can work with Crystal or CryoM data, or in, if you have that sort of special case, a combination of both. And it needs to adapt gracefully over a wide resolution range. I will say though that at present Isolde is designed primarily for data sets with resolutions lower than about two angstroms. In particular, once you can start to see alternate conformers, you're better off using other packages because Isolde just simply does not work with alternate conformers at present. Um, it's designed to be fast and in particular, the, uh, my goal here is that it, your trivial fixes, so adjusting a rhythm of flipping a peptide bond, should, be, should take a trivial amount of time. You, you don't want to be fiddling torsion by torsion, dialing up um, changes where uh, you see a problem, you can see where things need to be. It should take seconds, not minutes, to fix any particular problem. Um, and one of my biggest goals in doing all of this has been to reduce the cycle, uh, the, the, let, let's call it the traditional cycle of get the list of problems in your model, work through that list as best you can, fix it, run a refinement and get a new list of problems to go through and instead show you directly on the model when, as you're working with it exactly where things are wrong and things are improving. And again, we'll see what I'm talking about shortly. And it should be low cost. Uh, so the idea is here is to aim for good performance on gaming hardware. Now, when I say low cost, it doesn't mean it's going to run well on your average $300 laptop, but the uh, more you will need for, for optimum performance, you will want a, a gaming level GPU. So your, your GTX 1070 um, is a good starting point. Uh, and the, the examples you'll be seeing are mostly recorded actually on a gaming laptop with a NVIDIA GTX 1070 GPU. And it's designed to be extensible. I've, um, not all of the API is well documented at the moment, but most of it is, and I hope is, is relatively clean for people that want to do their own scripted work with it. That is all possible. So the general workflow in Azolder and it, most importantly, upfront, Isolde is not designed to be a fire and forget automated package. So where you load your model and your map, you press play and it does something for you. If you do that, it will fix a lot of the, the simpler problems on its own, just because that, that's what molecular dynamics does. Once you start it moving, it will find its way into a, into a lower energy minimum. So a lot of problems will go away on their own. But it's what it's primarily designed for is to make that human task as easy as possible. And in particular, this is a, um, the golden rule I picked up from um, Chris Williams on the mole probity team actually, is that human eyes really should see each residue in context with its density at least once. And 
making it as easy as possible for people to do that, even in large models, is very important because the things you see in models, are, even high resolution models that are otherwise very well re refined, can be really quite amazing. Um, so the starting point for Isolde, you will need a preliminary model and map. The versions of Isolde that are out in the wild right now don't have tools for adding residues. They are coming, but right now it's a tool for rebuilding the preliminary model you have. It doesn't necessarily have to be a very good model. It, uh, it really doesn't need to be a very good model, but it has to have at least part of it fitting reasonably well. In crystallography, you're talking a valid molecular replacement solution that has ideally been extended by whichever auto building package you prefer. In cryo-EM, either an auto-built or a reasonable homology model with as much as possible rigid body or dock to your map. You will need hydrogens present, but in most cases that can be done directly in Chimera-X with the add H command. But the main goal tool, the, the main jobs you will be doing in Azolder are small local simulations, which are how you achieve interactive speeds. So the, the actual preparation of a simulation is, is entirely automatic. You just select your atoms, uh, the atoms that you're interested in, it can be anything from a single atom up to the entire model, and press the play button and it will, it will start a little local simulation to cover the region that you're interested in. And there are interactive tutorials available, uh, a simple getting started tutorial and a, a slightly more complex uh, interactive uh, docking example that you can use in Chimerix just on the command line running Isolde Tute will bring that up for you. Anyway, so this is what you will see when you start Isolde and run it, start a simulation. And this is where most of the important tools are your essential unit operations for working with a model. So I'll go through these in a little bit of uh, detail. So firstly, the, the tools at the, at the top here are your, your tools for interacting with a single uh, amino acid, your, your, your peptide backbone, your rotor and side chain. And that becomes active whenever a single amino acid is selected. So you will, you will see live information about the current rotomer, um, the, uh, the, which conformation it's in and uh, um, uh, the, the, gen, the expected frequency of that rotoma and the z-score. And in this case, it's, it's red because this is an outlier. Uh, the tools here will allow you to switch through previews of, um, of, of known good rotomers. And then you, can use, then you can choose to either commit the coordinates of that rotomer or set, the, set it as a target for restraints, which will allow the simulation to go smoothly there. The buttons just above that, the, these two here, allow you to flip a peptide bond in plane or sister trans or vice versa. You, the, the little tool here just is a simple tool for extending a selection forward or backwards along a, a chain, either for starting a simulation or for applying secondary structure restraints, which are here, which beca they, this becomes available when you have a selection, a continuous sequence of at least three amino acids as a selection, you can add restraints to, to force this towards alpha helix or, or beta strands, parallel, anti-parallel. Uh, there's a tool over here for shifting any selection in register where you have a, where you found a stretch of your model that is completely shifted by one or more residues from where it should be. And especially in the early stages of model building, this can be uh, disturbingly common and it is a disturbingly common problem in deposited models at the lower resolutions where any anything from a half a dozen to many dozens of residues need to be completely shifted. This, this tool will, will shift any continuous sequence of amino acids by any number you like, as long as they, they're not disulfide bonded or linked to things that will actually stop them moving, of course. Um, the tools here, you can take any heavy atom in your model and pin it with a harmonic restraint to any point in space, and that will appear as, as a small pin with a dashed line to, to show you where, it, where it's uh, attached to. And that can be very useful for many different things, uh, especially 
uh, for setting up complex rearrangements or for just sim simply put, uh, put it, uh, temporarily restraining an atom to a position while you're moving the, the things around it. And finally, down here, we can restrain the distance between any two non-hydrogen atoms. So, now let's actually have a look at um, some of the things that actually, how Zelda looks like in, in, your, in your model window as these things are running. So we have a few videos here. And firstly, the, 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 this, this video is designed just simply to illustrate why I consider molecular dynamics to be the tool for, for this sort of work. And the, the idea here being that the model does behave like a real object. So here we have the model jiggling away in its map. I will, in a second, reduce the temperature down to zero Kelvin, so the atoms only move when I do things with it. Now, with traditional restraints, if I did this to the model, you would call me absolutely crazy because those atoms would simply just fall into the density I just dragged them into. But here, the atoms just push back and everything falls back into place. Um, other things you will note here, if I just pause this for a second, you may note that each of the alpha carbons is a colored sphere. And we can see most of them are green and happy. We can see one that's slightly yellow here. We can't see any pink or red ones, which are good, but which is good in this case, because what we are looking at is uh, uh, the live status of these residues on the Ramachandran plot. So any Ramachandran outlier will immediately show on the model as a, a pink sphere on the C alpha. Over here on the right, we see this little exclamation mark with a spiral beside it telling us that this residue is a marginal rotomer. Uh, uh, up here, we can see another smaller indicator. And for very serious rotomer outliers, those will grow larger and become a, a more dark pink color. We'll see that in a minute. Now, the, the, coming back to that point, the trivial problems should take a trivial amount of time. If we look at this particular loop, I'll pause it, we can see a whole lot of different problems highlighted here. We can see our Rotomer outliers, we can see Ramachandran outliers, and these yellow filled in cups are uh, telling us that these peptide bonds are severely twisted more than 30 degrees out of the plane, and actually they're almost in cis conformation here. But Isolde makes a few assumptions about twisted peptide bonds, and one of the assumptions is that if it's more than 30 degrees from, uh, uh, from a planar configuration, it should probably be in trans and it will restrain them as such. So in this case, as soon as I press the play button to start the simulation, most of these problems simply go away in the minimizer. So we will see that in a second. I've just selected the model, the selected this region. We'll press play, and they, they, those problems simply go away. And all that's really left to do is fix the one Rotomer outlier that's in the wrong confirmation there. So, moving on. Um, now, the, 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 one of the big advantages of real-time validation, I find, and what I was actually really surprised by when I added it, particularly the, the Rotomer validation, is that it finds many problems that by eye, I would have in the past simply gone straight past. And here we have three side chains that each look like they're, they're in fairly well modeled into the density. And they don't look by eye to be particularly wrong. And yet the, um, the uh, mole probity validation contours based on um, many tens of thousands of, uh, of residues are saying quite clearly that each of these are very low probability confirmations. And sure enough, if, I go, if we go through here, we could, for each of these in turn, we can go through and dial up an, a better confirmation, and those are fixed. And that's literally as fast as, as it goes. So um, now, before I get into the next recent developments, a little housekeeping note. The, the following features you'll see are only available in the development versions of Isolde, which require the latest Chimerix daily build. If you do install the daily build, then go to the tool shed to install Isolde, you will get the Isolde development built. And as soon as Chimerix, the, the Chimerix team release a new Chimerix stable release, I will be releasing a new stable Isolde release. The, plat the following videos are recorded 
in real time using uh, the Windows 10 Xbox Live game streaming uh, tool uh, on a, a, th this laptop, a, a, a 2000, early 2016 era gaming laptop with a GTX 1070 and a Core i7 CPU. It's recorded in Windows, but the performance in Windows versus Linux is approximately approximately the same. Performance on the Mac is not as good simply because, in general, the Mac GPUs aren't really geared towards heavy-duty uh, GPU computing. It is older, will run on a Mac. It runs quite happily even on my MacBook Air. It is just slower, so you're you're a little bit more limited in what you can do. But moving on, let's have a look. So the first uh, big advance, big advance I've, I've made in the past few months for people, especially for people with Crystal Lake graphic data, is that Isolde now does its own structure factor calculations. If you give it a, a Crystal Lake graphic data set as intensities or uh, amplitudes, um, it will load those in and Every time your coordinates change, it will be doing structure factor calculations in the background. And those are all parallelized over all available CPUs. But before this, um, as all the, has been using the GPU fairly heavily, but they, on most computers, there are lots of CPUs just sitting idle. So now it's using those for structure factor calculations. So the model here is, um, is PDB ID 3IO0, which is actually the, the model that will load if you click up, click the little load demo button in the top left corner of Azolda's panel. Now it's fairly small, 230 residues, around 17,500 observed reflections. And in this demonstration, all the atoms are mobile. And with those structure factor calculations, it achieves roughly two map updates a second. And so here I'm just showing, uh, drag, dragging some of the atoms around. You can see the, the, the difference map updates as it goes. And this particular particular loop has five, um, uh, four uh, non-proline cis-peptide bonds, all of which are wrong and need to be fixed. And so the demonstration here is just going through fixing the first one just by using the buttons on the Isolde panel, but you can also do those via the command line with the, the command Isolde sysflip uh, will let you flip any selection of those all at once. And you can see that, that as soon as I do that, the maps start to, the map starts to improve over this loop. And we also have a little rotom route layer here as the last little job to do. And that, that loop is essentially good to go. So now these, so that's for, that's for a moderately sized um, model. Uh, of course, as, as your data set gets larger, those background structure factor calculations get a little bit slower, but they don't, they shouldn't slow down the actual running of your local simulation. Everything is happening in the background in its own separate thread. So all that happens is that you, the, the, the time between map updates starts to slow down. But of course, if you have, if you happen to be working with a very small data set, like this unpublished, um, Excuse me. Like this unpublished um, micro ED data set I got to play with over the last week or two, things get really fun. So this is a tiny little model, uh, 120 residues, uh, uh, just over 2,400 observed reflections. Your mapped updates really become almost real time. So, uh, and that okay. I'll move on. Further. Now, for this next bit is uh, in particularly useful for the cryo EM people, I think, but also for cases, for the very common case where you have a low resolution data set, but there's also an existing high resolution model of the same protein or a um, very closely related one. These adaptive distance restraints allow you to restrain the model either to its own starting coordinates or to the coordinates of a reference model. Now, for people that are familiar with the, the CCP4 tool ProSmart, this is very similar to that. These are adaptive distance restraints that uh, pull just like a normal harmonic restraint when the, the distance is close to its target, but as it deviates further and further from, from the, the target, 
it uh, starts to they start to weaken, so they, they don't pull as strongly. The idea being that it maintains the geometry when it's close to um, to the target, but it still allows a large conformational changes where those actually make sense. And now these look like just this um, web of restraints between atoms. The the green ones here are restraints that are close to satisfied. The thickness of them is telling you how strongly they're pulling. These purple ones are restraints that have given up and essentially stopped pulling. Now, these are not available via the Isolde GUI panel at the moment, but via the Chimera X command line. You have the, the commands Isolde restrain distances, Isolde release distances, and Isolde adjust distances. And to get details on how to use those, just like any other Chimera X command, if you put the, the command usage in front of any of these, the log will print out uh, the details on all the options available to you. Uh, now, in the Isolde tutorial, if, if you run that command Isolde uh, tutorial, then what you will get is the, the example here, which is refitting uh, the ATP bound state of a uh, 4.1 angstrom um, uh, membrane modifying protein into the four angstrom resolution ATP free, free state, which is a very large conformational change. So this last video is going to, to, to show how these restraints allow you to, to do that task, that, that, that initial task of the, 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 the really bulk flexible fitting of your model into the map before you get into the details of actually tidying up the, at, at the individual residue scale. So here we have the, the initial the map a rigid body fitted in, uh, model rigid body fitted into the map. And we can see on the right, we have a fairly large um, conformational shift needed. Now, what I'm typing down the bottom is that uh, is older restrained distances for the, the first, for the two chains on the left. Uh, so we're going to restrain those two towards their starting conformation. And then the two chains on the right. So that's restraining the two on the left, including their interface, and the two on the right, including their interface, but those two pairs are free to move separately from each other. And in this case, we, we, it's a 906 residue model is just around the maximum size where interactive speeds are possible on, on this system. Now, of course, when you have that many restraints in place, it's better to um, to cut out the details when, when, when they're not necessary. So you can, if you hide all atoms other than alpha carbons, you'll get this C alpha trace visualization that makes this much easier. Now, Isolde now has a tool that will allow you to simply tug on the selected atoms. So I've selected the carbon alphas of the, this chain, and now I'm just using the mouse to, to tug. And the, I repeat, this is a, a real-time capture of this task. So you can tug towards where you need to be, and then in, typically in fairly short bursts is the best idea. And then once it gets close, you'll see a really quite satisfying falling into the map of the model in, into that confirmation. And so that, that gets that initial flexible fitting job out of the way quite quickly. If we get into the details of this one, we will see various places where helices need to make a, a larger conformational change, uh, but uh, restricted by um, these restraints. But if we look down here, we see this, this gap has, that has opened up, which is absolutely real. And that is actually surrounding where the ATP was bound in the original map, but in the ATP free state, this, this, these two helices really open apart. And when you see cases like that, you, you can choose to selectively re release those um, strained uh, restraints, which we'll he see here, as all the release distances, model one, strained only true or strained true. Actually, that's right. While I was recording this video, I forgot my own command, so I'm just running usage as older restrained distances. And you'll see in the log all the details of what to do.
and you'll know, you might know this as well, the Chimerics command line is designed so that you can abbreviate most commands, and as long as they're unambiguous, it will, it will work out what to do with them. So that releases most of those strained ones so that they're no longer uh, making any pull at all on your model. If we, if we just go back to that uh, C alpha trace again and look around, you'll see most of the model is, is fairly well fitted, but there, there are exceptions. Uh, in this particular model, it turns out there is one helix that is out of register and, and needs to be corrected. I don't think we'll have time to actually show that in here. But what you can also do in cases like this where the, the distance restraints are actually preventing the, the, this, this pair of helices from falling into their true, um, uh, their true configuration, is you can selectively release only the distance restraints on these that are between them and some and mod, and atoms outside of the selection. So you can release the, the Isolde release distances external only true will maintain the internal geometry restraints while bringing them up to move and fall into that map. Um, so, um, and the idea here is that as soon as you've as soon as you finish that bulk um, fitting, you can go ahead and simply release all of those restraints and move straight onto the task of all, all the fine scale cleanups of your model. So here we we have a a problem that comes out, and I believe is actually a problem in the original model. Is it we we see most of the model has been fairly well fitted by this stage, but we see there's a, a loop that's really quite horribly out here. And if we, if we bring all the atoms up and start looking closely at the fit of atoms to density, we can see um, that the, the side chains really aren't, aren't fitting very, very well at all. We've got this loop that's out. If we spend a bit of time, sorry if I'm making you dizzy with this one, uh, usually a lot better when you're the one controlling the mouse. Uh, um, we, we find fairly soon that this helix is out of register. Uh, you, especially when you look at the, these uh, aromatic residues up here, you can see the big aromatic side chain blobs that the, the residues really aren't fitting into. And a little bit more ex inspection further up suggests that, that, that the chain goes out of register roughly the middle of the screen that we're looking at here. And so this gives us a chance to actually use as old as register shifting. Oh, okay, sorry, uh, that video stops there, unfortunately. Um, uh, yes, uh, so that does let us use the uh, Isolde's register shifting tool, but unfortunately that has been cut out of the video. But it, um, it turns out to be a, a fairly straightforward task to, to smoothly fit that into the density, and it takes five or ten minutes to get that rebuilt into, into its true um, state. Um, anyway, oh, here it is, I, I think. Uh, no, that's, sorry. Um, anyway, I will finish there uh, with some acknowledgments. Of course, the Chimerics team have been absolutely wonderful helpers with all of this, uh, particularly um, Tom Goddard um, helping me get, get started with the, the graphics engine and um, Eric for really the core atomic code and Conrad for the, the toolshed work. My, all my uh, crystallographic calculations in particular and all, all the symmetry and map handling is using Clipper from Kevin Carlton and the uh, Python bindings these days using PyBind11. The molecular dynamics engine behind all of this is OpenMM, uh, 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 who, which is primarily maintained by uh, Peter Eastman over at Stanford. All the peptide validation uh, is based on the, the data from the Richardson lab. Some upcoming stuff, so Isolde now supports um, sugars and there will be validation tools for that coming using some combination of the, the validation tools from the Glycam team and from John Aguirre at the University of York. Uh, with the latest versions, 
is older now supports roughly twelve or thirteen thousand ligands uh, of the of the more common ligands in the protein data bank, and that's primarily courtesy of a project by Nigel Moriarty from the Phoenix team and Dave Case. And on that note, I should mention that so the the, the actual for, molecular dynamics force field is older is using is amber. And I am working on a pipeline to the new the new Amber tools in Phoenix to allow Phoenix to parameterize your your novel ligands for you and provide them in a format for is older to use, and that should be ready uh, to to go live within the next few months. We I, we're also working on a. The, a remote interface to allow Phoenix to use is older as a visualization tool and to to interplay with with them so that you can rebuild your model in as older and then send it to Phoenix for a final uh, refinement and on the right uh, top right uh, the various crystallographers I've, I've worked with who've uh, uh, gave me my start in all of this and of course the read lab where I actually work and, and Randy and Ellie in, in particular for their hospitality and with that I will I'll stop here and take any questions that people have great thank you very much um, for questions you can send them to me by chat we can also uh, unmute, though, we have to be a little careful. I think it's a small enough group. Well, we've got about a dozen, 16 people, so not to talk over each other, but it should work. I can uh, kick it off. I have uh, one question about, can you um, can you see the free energies or um, the uh, parameterization around the model in real time or output it in some uh, way? I could. I, I have thought about doing that, and it, it would actually be quite straightforward to do. It's just that what you would see, of course, is only the free energy of the portion of the model that happens to be mobile for this particular simulation. So it's not your overall energy, but that that may still well still be useful. Yeah, I was and, thinking of it um, in a similar way, like maybe the um, like a real time correlation coefficient or something, or some sort of metric well, of real space fitting. But yeah, could yes, also. Be um, yeah, so I, I and so I could actually provide just the map energy, the map energy component as well to give you some, give you some idea of that. But I, I on that note, I am planning to add a, a real time, uh, real space correlation coefficient validation tool that doesn't exist in is older just yet. Uh, the, it, it has a geometric validation, but not map to model correlation tools. So that, that will be coming. So yeah. we had a sort of related question. What's the sort of upper limit that you know for map resolution? Can it go to eight or ten angstroms? Where would it, how, how low would well, you go? It's it, it's a difficult question to answer, but essentially it's it's the same. Uh, you can go in one sense. You can go to any as low a resolution as you like. It's just, of course, the lower the resolution, the more external prior knowledge you need. So, especially if you if you're starting with a good model, um, at the, at the, a known good model, and you're just refitting into lower resolution density, you can use those adaptive distance restraints to restrain to the starting conformation, so that and then just flexible fit into into any resolution map you like. If you're having to build from scratch. Beyond, in, let's say, in cryo EM density, up to about four and a half angstroms is possible. It starts to get quite difficult at those resolutions, of course. But especially if you have lots of helices, four and a half, four and a half angstroms cryo EM data is is absolutely workable. Uh, crystallographic, I'd say, probably closer to the four four angstrom point for for true rebuilding from scratch. But um, but yeah, the, the more prior information you have that you can restrain to, the, the, the lower the resolution you can really go. Okay. Uh, any anyone else? Great. Well, I, thank you very much, Tristan. I think that the uh, no that the real time improvement of maps as you drag atoms around, you yeah. know, for me because I've you know been around yeah. for a while, is pretty awesome. That's really amazing oh, to oh, see. Thank I mean, you. That's, yeah, it's really cool. 
Yeah. And actually, it does remind me, I should add one, uh, one more note for, for people. Uh, that Isolde isn't designed to, to entirely um, replace refinement. I mean, the, the dream is that one day that model building and refinement all become one continuous process. But right now, some things it doesn't do, it doesn't touch B factors at all. So if you're doing big rearrangements, you, you really want to stop and refine B factors. That, that may change in the, in the future, but it might take a while. Um, so it's, it is still designed to iterate between model building and, and refinement. It's just designed to try and reduce it from sort of 50 or 100 rounds of that to a few. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Well, with that, uh, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, take care. Thank you.